Hey guys, Nick Espinoza, your Chief Security Fanatic here, and today I've got a very special guest. You see I am not alone on my screen, and this is also going to be longer than my normal two minutes. I am here with Yossi Applebaum. Now, before we dive into who Yossi is and why he is with me, we're going to start with Bloomberg. Now, on October 4th, they released an article basically saying that the Chinese government had infiltrated a company called Supermicro to insert processors, the grain of the size of a grain of rice into this and send these to like the government, Amazon, Apple, all of that. They followed this up on October 9th with another article uh, basically quoting Yossi from Sepio Systems saying that they had discovered this in a major US telecom. Now, one of the things that we are not gonna be discussing is all of the particulars of that. There's a ton of information out there. Everybody has said everything. You can make up your mind on that. But what we are gonna be talking about today is supply chain hacking, which is what this whole Supermicro situation is and how it's affecting us on a worldwide scale. So Yossi, thank you for being here with me today. Thank you. Thank Great, you now, now please uh, tell me more about Sepio Systems and what you guys do before we get going. So Sepio is a two and a half years old startup cybersecurity company. We are actually focused on a keeping a hardware infrastructure clean as much as possible helping our customers, which are mostly enterprises, to keep their infrastructure, their digital infrastructure, hygiene. Mm -hmm. We okay. have a software platform in a SaaS module that deploys into the enterprise, and we use that in order to perform that uh, service. So basically, it, your focus then primarily in the cybersecurity realm is on the hardware side, how it's totally. secured, how it's developed, all of this kind of stuff. Now, uh, you know, as we were talking, we're going to be discussing supply chain hacking. Do you want to let everybody know uh, what supply chain hacking is, how that, yes. how that affects us? Yeah, let's start by defining what is supply chain. So most of the people that we'll talk uh, with uh, will define supply chain uh, between the manufacturing process and when the device or the box actually lands on their footstep or mm -hmm. doorstep, sorry. Uh, that's wrong. A uh, supply chain starts when someone thinks thinks way before design on an idea to develop something, and it ends when the device ends its life, when you throw it to the trash. So a uh, supply chain includes actually the phases of design, implementation, manufacturing, subcontracting in most cases, delivery, integration, and post-integration processes, including the, eventually the technicians that help uh, to keep the devices up and running. So while looking on the entire set of, uh, or the span of device, uh, of a uh, supply chain, sorry, uh, it's really hard to uh, focus in, on specific links within the chain and, and make sure that they are secured and think that your supply chain is secured. You need to take an holistic uh, view on that. And eventually we came into a conclusion that uh, it's too complex. It's too complex and it's almost impossible, as, especially for non-governmental enterprise or enterprises to uh, put their hands on so many details that most of them are on the other side of the ocean. Uh, right. Our approach is different. Our approach is actually, and regardless if it's our solution or just the approach, our solution, uh, uh, sorry, our approach is a, let's face reality. Let's understand that supply chain is potentially broken and let's deal with that by securing the enterprise against the result uh, of such a broken supply chain. Yeah, and I think that's a, I think that's a really good point. Uh, just as somebody that obviously is also in cybersecurity and we work on a lot of different cybersecurity frameworks like NIST, which is now really pushing supply chain holistically. I think what you're saying is absolutely correct. It's, it's not just who I'm buying stuff from and how I have access to so much as it is from start to finish, you know, and it, it's, I think it's one of those things that we, we can no longer escape. And when we're looking at these major hacks that have happened over the years, the targets, the Home Depots, et cetera, it ends up being somewhere in their supply chain where they're getting hit and compromised, whether it's they're getting elevated access or, or hardware and all of that. And <clears throat> I'm wondering, because you're focusing purely on the hardware side, is it, is it you specifically, or Sepio rather, going through, looking at schematics 
Um, so if you're going to go into a data center and, and try to find something like a, like a compromised server that's hit in some way, I mean, are you looking at original manufacturer diagrams and specs? Are they giving these to you? Or are you just looking at it, um, you know, from a, from a hardware data flow standpoint? Like, how does that, how does that work on your end? So it depends who's the customer and depends uh, what we, uh, what's the scope of our work. Uh, if uh, in a case, specific case, for example, we work with vendors, the manufacturers themselves, or the, actually the brand names, in most cases, they are not actual the manufacturers due to the globalization of that. But uh, when we talk and work with them, in some cases, we get a deeper look into the schematics, design documents, and uh, insights inside the device. In the, on the other side of the spectrum, we work with the end users. These don't have that kind of information. And uh, what we try to do there is uh, map and assess uh, where are the pain points and maybe the potential threats. In some cases, actual attack tools. In some cases, it's just a threat uh, that need to be deeper dived and explored. Now, when, when you're saying attack tools on the user side, are you talking about infections that users are getting that are infecting hardware because you're focusing on that like a firmware attack? Or are you talking about the standard software like crypto infections, surveillance tools, all that kind of stuff? Or is it everything? Are you just starting at the hardware level, but you're also addressing software? So no, we don't address software. I think there are many solutions in the market to address that problem, and they are doing quite a good job in, in securing that. Uh, we are focused on the verge between the hardware and the firmware, which is really a se semantic in many cases, because uh, if it is a programmable logic device, which is hardware component, but it runs firmware in order to perform its work, is it hardware or firmware? So uh, we don't get into that dictionary definitions, and eventually a device is, you know, eventually, it's a box, and there is electronic components inside, and we are uh, looking on that as part of our scope. Now, uh, we see implants or components, you know, uh, uh, in different ways and in different types. In most cases, by the way, we would see them outside the box uh, for many reasons. If I'm the attacker and I want to uh, create damage without being caught, and if I'll be caught, no one will be able to eventually link that damage to me. Uh, I should take it as far as possible from the manufacturing. Oh, that makes perfect uh, sense. Yeah. Uh, and so we found, uh, you know, implants inside on cables, on, on uh, you know, hidden uh, under desks uh, in some cases, or even within racks. Uh, in some cases, it's inside boxes. Yes, inside server uh, machines inside Ethernet switches, mouse, keyboard, and many, many other devices that actually are used in order to uh, attack the organization through the outdoor uh, side of it. Now, now let, me, let me ask you this. When, when you're finding these things that are integrated into the hardware, are, are they primarily used for like surveillance tools? Are they going to be exfiltrating data? Is it just anything and everything um, you know, that, that you've got going? What, what do you primarily see when you are looking at specific attacks like if my mouse is infected why is that important like what what is it doing for me i know why it's important i'm just for, for the general yeah. audience like why is that well, what are we going to see what, what is that user going to see what or not see what is it going to be doing well you know we, eventually we need to go back and understand why people are uh, attacking throughout or there are two main, main yeah. reasons it's actually the same as in software but uh, in a different way Eventually, uh, the attacker wants to steal your information or create damage. And create damage in some cases in order to get the leverage and get some money. But uh, the main idea is that uh, in order to steal information, hardware is the best way to do it. Uh, in most cases, hardware attacks uh, will not be found uh, by any of the existing cyber tools, okay? Because whatever you can do in software uh, in order to a spy and steal information from a, a, your targets if you are the attacker, eventually you need to use the customer network in order to exfiltrate the data out. Mm -hmm. And if the customer is strictly monitors that, it's quite hard to do that, especially for a long term. 
if you are using an hardware implant or an outer device in order to do that, and we'll get back to your mouse question in a second, it's much easier because the hardware has an option to have an out-of-band network interface, wireless, cellular, whatever, and right. we found many of these. So much more uh, robust uh, for a longer term, and even if you'll catch that eventually, you don't know what they took. You don't know for how long they've been there because your uh, forensic tools, your uh, monitoring tools have no clue uh, of what happened and how and for how long. Uh, and that's another layer of threats uh, even after fact, after you found that attack. The mouse is actually a great example and we use that in many, many of our discussions with customers. We found malicious mouse mouses uh, in different uh, uh, locations around the globe. Uh, inside the mouse, someone can hide, or actually not can, someone hides a small computer that actually mm -hmm. uh, plays a game with your computer. So that small computer is actually looks uh, in, in front of the computer as a virtual keyboard. The keyboard don't see a key, the computer, your computer don't see the keyboard as a threat. And by doing that, they can actually send commands to your machine. They actually used another path of data from the machine out towards that computer and then through a wireless interface outside their network, but they don't want to do it in public and explain how they did it. It worked out of band for a long time. In some case, in one case, for more than half a year, these criminals were stealing information from a D1 bank. And that's a oh. concern. Yeah, and I mean, it also begs the question of how they're physically able to get the mouse into the, you know, or whatever the hardware is. Uh, and you brought up an interesting point too, because one of the things that I I do when I'm walking my clients through assessments or my potential clients is, okay, who are you catering to? Who wants to hack you? You know, are you are you going to be a target for groups like Anonymous? Is it going to be state-sponsored hacking because you've got intellectual property they might want? Uh, and we've run into some very interesting cases where. You know, it's just that, you know, where we have to contend with groups like Anonymous or ISIS or North Korea, you know, you never knew, you never know who's going to want uh, that, that information. And so you can't look at yourself as an organization and say, well, this is what we do. No, it's who you cater to. And most companies out there are, even on the large scale, are catering to even larger companies or bigger governments that they may have intimate access to. Um, <clears throat> so with this... Go, please. Let, let, me, let me tell you something interesting. Uh, it's not always the size. You know, we have small customers and we have large customers. And small customers, uh, in some cases, are under the thumb of a really large uh, criminal organizations or even state-level uh, attackers from the other side of the world. Uh, a, a good example for that can be a regional bank that serves specific customers that are in interest of other country right. or and you know i live in dc you can uh, imagine that many of the regional banks that are here are potentially right. under the scope of the enemies of the u.s right and, right. and so it's not just size wise in most cases it's really who's the customer who's his customers and in some cases geolocation is a critical in part of the uh, the equation there Right. No, I, I think that's a that's a really good point. And the other thing that I wanted to bring up too, just going back to you know hardware infrastructure, if they're exfiltrating data, meaning they are stealing data and moving it out through the through the company's own network, uh, a lot of companies are running advanced uh, technology at the perimeter, meaning they've got good next generation firewalls like Palo Alto Networks or Checkpoint, mm -hmm. you know, something at that level. Um, that you can do things like application whitelist and blacklist on, so you're not allowing specific um, Absolutely. traffic in and out. Now, if you've got a situation like this where you've got your mouse, and we'll just keep using that because it's such an easy example, um, how, is, how is an advanced detection technology, how is it going to bypass an advanced detection technology like a Palo Alto Networks firewall or, or something, on, something at that level? Because they are using out-of-band connections. They are using a cellular connection or a Wi-Fi connection to an out-of-band uh, network. And in such case, no one will pay attention to that because it's not running through the network. So gotcha. what we keep saying to our customers is, uh, A, it can happen through out-of-band connection, and B, you won't know anything after you'll find it. And 
back to that story, uh, in many cases, we actually create the, the bridge between these uh, air gap networks in some cases, totally air gap networks, and their forensic tools by actually bringing that information to the forensic. So uh, it's really out of band. It really can be totally air gapped and still data is out. And uh, we keep showing people and they are amazed how much uh, their air gap, so-called air gap network can be easily uh, penetrated from outside. Yeah, I mean, and it goes, it goes beyond creating like a zero trust infrastructure, you know, not, not even it's air gapping, which means you're physically removing the computers or devices from the network, and you're still able to plug things in to exfiltrate over a cellular network. That's kind of crazy. Um, I, I wanted to get your take on this. I, I just actually read this article yesterday. Um, it's about uh, basically Iran. Their, their nuclear program right now is, is, it looks like it got hit with another Stuxnet type situation that is infecting and causing a whole lot of chaos on that. And the world is kind of silent right now, <laughs> you know, as they're dealing with that. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Specifically, because I stuck nets, Stuxnet, I, I have always found very, very fascinating. For those that don't know, it's, it was a very specific and tailored uh, virus that um, actually, I think it was the Israelis as well as the CIA were able to infiltrate into the Iranian nuclear program. And, uh, and basically wreak havoc on what's called the SCADA system that they had illegally purchased, shutting down their nuclear program. And Iran seems to be having a similar issue in the last 24 to 48 hours. And I was wondering uh, about your take on that, just given your background and, and what you do on hardware and everything else. So I spent, as, as you know, I spent my time in the Israeli uh, in intelligence community in the past. Right. And due to the fact that my chairman is the recent former director of the Mossad, and one of my advisors is the, is the uh, uh, former CISO for the CIA, uh, I would say that I hope it's true, but I really don't want, don't want to talk <laughs> about enough. that. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. And uh, yeah, and we hadn't talked about that before, to be fair, you know, <laughs> everything, but it just literally just in the last 24 hours. So we Our question. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it just, you know, I just, I keep up on the news, and as people who follow me know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about these things every day. So I, I, the only thing I, I, I would say that I wish all of us, especially in this part of the world, uh, that news like that will eventually will become true and will save lives on both sides. Uh, there is no more than a constructional damage to a program that shouldn't be running in any case, right. I guess. Uh, but no one is dying based on that, which is, I guess, good for everyone. Right. Yeah, I, I, I would I would agree. I would agree. Um, <laughs> so we'll jump gears then. And let's look forward because we have a major problem in the United States. Uh, and, and with the government itself in terms of cybersecurity, we, we are a bit of a confederacy. Uh, a lot of different government, uh, you know, a lot of different government agencies and departments have different standards, even though they have very similar compliances. Uh, you know, recently, there was a case of the USGS, US Geological Service, basically getting shut down with Russian malware, and it was, had nothing to do with the Russians. It was some guy going to, to, to adult websites that was getting everything infected, and he was bringing in a flash drive and all that. But what I, I want to talk to you about is, we have for the next 100 plus years, as long as this country is going to be surviving, we're going to have elections. And our elections are increasingly uh, more electronic. And while it's confederated, some of us punch a hole or draw a line, some of us tap a screen, you know, because you deal on the hardware side, and we've seen very, uh, very easy hacks and identification of, of how to break into these things at, at, you know, conferences like Black Hat and, and RSA, what, what does the future for election security look like in the United States when you know, you're dealing with infecting hardware? How easy it, would it be to do that? And, and how would we defend the United States in an election to ensure it? And obviously there are different things like information campaigns and all that, but the actual voting process itself, how are we as a nation gonna move forward and uh, secure that at the hardware level? Well, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful questions with a very complex answer. Uh, we are dealing with that uh, a bit, uh, too little, I think, and not just as a company, but as a society. And uh, we, I would assume, uh, and it's a educated guess, I guess, that uh, 
governments outside, uh, from outside the U.S. would and are uh, manipulating our uh, voting results uh, because it's too e so easy to do it. It is. Some, yeah. some of these machines are, uh, you know, created in the 80s or early 90s, and uh, there is no security in mind in these uh, computers eventually. And right. some of them are not even patched. Uh, that's on the software side to the recent uh, OSs, but all of them in common, I would say, have external interfaces that can easily manipulate it. And one interesting thing, uh, I was looking into that uh, in more details uh, around the, be the beginning of 2018 for a cause, and a voting machine and uh, in some aspects, ATM machines, I'm sorry for uh, no. taking you out of that, are very much in common in terms of vulnerabilities, especially on the hardware side. Yeah. Eventually, you have some device that was crafted outside uh, by, you know, there's a computer, some kind of a sort of an input device, regardless if it's a card reader or a keyboard, some custom keyboard but, and, and, and other uh, maybe custom input devices, but eventually uh, all of them are connected uh, to a centralized location. And regardless how good it is uh, encrypted, and I doubt that also, especially with the old machines, if any, but regardless how good is the encryption, eventually these lines are exposed for physical uh, manipulation, physical air manipulation. I don't want to be too techy, but uh, mm -hmm. it's really a relatively easy to penetrate a network and even manipulate data or perform a denial of service or selective a denial of service attack by actually looking on the physical layer of a network. And right. while uh, all of these states eventually that responsible for maintaining these voting machines are doing a bit of a work on that, I don't think they look on the big picture and understand the threat, especially in a public places that there are at minimum dozens of thousands of people that has a physical access to that equipment. Right. And that's a concern. Yeah, no, at, absolutely. I mean, and it's something that, you know, we've brought up. I don't know if you know, I, I actually um, write articles for Forbes and all that. And I've, I've brought up you know, election hacking. Interestingly enough, on, and on a complete aside, and probably three of my viewers are going to know this, but we've actually run into ATMs uh, when we are doing work with banks that are running OS2, <laughs> specifically because they believe that nobody's going to know how to write an infection for the damn thing, you know, because it's, it's an old operating system from IBM that is now deployed. Well, yeah. There are crazy attackers that have enough information about that. Yeah. Right. And by the way, uh, the Secret Service just recently, a few months ago, released a and no to all, all of us actually about ATM jackpotting. And yeah. that's something that actually we are chasing all around the world. And we, in many cases, see manipulated hardware devices. And I'm not talking about the simple schemers uh, that are put in front of the ATM. I'm talking about a much more sophisticated attacks, even though it's off the shelf tools, off the shelf dark net tools, but right. uh, that allow pen, uh, attackers eventually to get a. Uh, uh, into that network of ATMs and jackpot money out of ATM by connecting some simple device uh, from outside. Yeah, it's and it's it's nonstop. What what never ceases to amaze me, especially on the hacking side, is just the innovation, just the way people are finding ways around the, the standard defenses, and it's perpetually cat and mouse. You know, we we get into a compromised client, we figure out what went on, we plug the holes, we build defenses, and then we're just waiting for that person to innovate around, whether it's a government agency or it's that 15 year old kid with a laptop and a, <laughs> you know, and just an insane amount of knowledge. And uh, yeah, it's, it's nonstop. But on the hardware side, it's, it's just really interesting because we have this expanding uh, need for bandwidth, this expanding need for use, our cloud storage. I, I, I read an article recently that Microsoft is ripping out servers, you know, at a rate of something like every six months at data centers to keep up with the with the increase that, that Azure needs for hard drive space and, and all of this. And uh, by virtue of that, I, I have to imagine it would be very easy and lucrative for either a criminal element or a state-sponsored hacking division to want to 
infiltrate and break in in the, in the most easy way. Uh, you know, and then on top of it, we've got organizations like WikiLeaks that are dumping locations of like every Amazon data center, which just happened. Uh, you know, I want to say about a month ago, they got an old document and they, they put it out there. And so if we're looking at this moving forward, if we're looking at our intellectual property and one of the largest wealth transfers in history is going on right now of stolen U.S. intellectual property moving to Asia, um, you know, what does it look like in terms of defense. We have no real compliant law here. We're a complete patchwork of various compliances. And a lot of us adhere to specific frameworks like NIST or, you know, CSA for the cloud and all that. But what does it look like from a hardware side when, you know, I am a, a Microsoft, for example, and I have, you know, a million servers worldwide sitting in data centers. You know, how, how am I going to understand uh, from your perspective, if I've got like, let's say five servers of that, of that million acting as exfiltration tools, for a government or hackers or, or the mafia or, you know, whatever it is. How, how, do, well, how, do, how do they defend against that? Well, let's start by understanding the anomaly in the market, okay? Uh, you know, every number wins between 100 to $200 billion on cyber spend. Everyone has his own magic number, but who right. cares what is the real number? How much out of that is going to secure hardware? One uh, crumb, two crumbs, yeah. nothing. Yeah, I'd, I'd say where I see most of the spending happen is on perimeter defense as well as monitoring tools for which the means that Which yeah. means that we actually almost beg to these attackers to use outro as an attack tool. Yeah, well, it's, it's a very easy way, as you just explained. But, but, and, how, but how's a Microsoft going to know, I guess? You know, they've got a, using easy numbers, they, they're in 100 data centers worldwide, and we know that's more, way more. But it's 100 data centers, and they've got like three machines in 100 data centers that are infected, whether it's a mouse and integrated an integration into a network card, a cable, a motherboard, like how, how do we holistically, and I understand it's hard to do that, how do we verify that everything we're plugging in is legit? Or how do we, the server that we're pulling out of the box, how do we know that that is not infected because it's, you know, somebody hit it in the supply chain? Well, I don't know anything about, you know, the way Microsoft is doing and uh, it's just I'm not... generic company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so you know. I, I don't want to talk about specific customers, but... Of course. Uh, of course. Or, uh, you know, names. Uh, and uh, I, I, I would say that uh, uh, if you are running a large array of data centers, you are, as you mentioned, you have million computers and you have millions of Ethernet ports and you have... Uh, millions of devices around them. It's not just the servers. Right. Uh, uh, the critical infrastructure, uh, infrastructure around that, the ICS systems around that. It's really, really hard uh, eventually to monitor everything, but they do. They do monitor everything in terms of the health of the network. They do uh, monitor everything in the, in the, uh, in the terms of uh, securing the network from in and from outside. I think what these companies need to have is first a, a roadmap on how to secure their servers. Now, Microsoft is a great example, although Google are doing the same. They have, and it's not a secret, it's in the public knowledge, a secured server a, a plans. A, they publish, especially Google, Google has their own, I don't remember names, but these companies as a, a, a knowledge and awareness about the need for a secured server platform. So right. they understand that, but it's a long roadmap in order to achieve that. And in any case, this is going to secure the server machine. But eventually uh, they have ethernet switches, they have network devices, uh, and they have uh, applications that run. So they secure the applications. They may secure the network from outside and maybe inside, but they don't secure, uh, as I understand at least, as I know, none of them, well, none of them work, works with me, so I know that none of them secures the physical layer of the network. Uh, and uh, that's a concern that needs to be addressed. Uh, on the hardware side, uh, they need to look and understand where is the pain point and protect against them. The referrals, uh, networking equipment, and so on, and so on, and so on. And this is where we try to help them to start by a roadmap and a plan uh, before uh, running and implementing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think it's a good point. And I, again, I'm, I'm speaking more generically. I just, I'm saying Microsoft because they were not mentioned in anything previously 
public, you know, <laughs> that you've been mentioned in. But yeah, it, maybe, 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 maybe. I, I think they are the only ones that were not mentioned. Maybe they are <laughs> the best. In, in, in <laughs> right. But if anything, that's a that's a feather in their cap. It's a check mark on the good <laughs> side. But I, like the point that I'm the point that I'm getting at is yeah. I mean we. I mean, we've, we've both been insecure socks. We've both seen, you know, just the level of detail and attention that these companies take uh, when they are ordering, when they are installing, when they are designing, building everything from the infrastructure to the cybersecurity side. But when we are dealing with something like a supply chain hacking and you are ordering, you know, your server from whoever your manufacturer is and you're pulling it out of the box, the assumption is that the manufacturer is taking that same level, that same care, that same you know, process. And so if I'm looking at this and I'm, I've got an influx of a thousand servers that I need to spin up in let's say two weeks into my network. And am I sitting there with a diagram, making sure that there's no processor with the, the size of a grain of rice on it, that's out of place. You know, I, it, it, it makes it, it makes it very difficult because there, there has at some point going to be a human process. We can, we can go through and use hardware and software tools to scan, to find all of this, but at the end of the day, there may be just us putting eyeballs on a device or a server or whatever that is to just really understand what it's doing. I, I, I had a, a interesting conversation with one of the uh, server vendors, not the ones that are in the news right now, okay. and just recently, and, uh, and their reaction uh, to the Bloomberg story, and I'm not going to talk about that specifically, mm -hmm. but their reaction was, it's impossible. And my question to them was, do you have any open connector on your board? Is that open connector would give me, as an attacker, an access to the network and or to the CPU or and or, I don't want to be too specific. I'm right. being very, very global. I understand. And, and third, if so, can I open your box without being caught? And if the answer is yes, yes, and yes, I think uh, potentially you have a problem. Now, right. server equals Ethernet switch, equals printer, right. equals barcode scanner, right. and we're not going to mention the mouse again, but mm -hmm. all of these devices suffer from the same vulnerability, okay? So the issue is that in most cases, there is no security in mind when we designed, we as a society, when we design these devices. Now, we wanted them to be generic. We wanted them to be open, open platforms. Mm -hmm. We wanted them to be flexible. And by doing that, which is a necessity, we yeah. also opened the door for abuse by using these openness right. uh, connections. And, you know, I remember, and there is a blog that I released a couple of years ago about USB, which is fundamentally broken because of the usability of it. So, yes. yes, we need USB. Yes, we are enjoying the ability to connect whatever we want, but we actually pay a price in terms of security, exactly yeah. like we pay a price in terms of security in networking, in Ethernet, yeah. and exactly like we pay a price by an open platform hardware. Yeah. So can we do something? Absolutely, we can do a lot. Right. Uh, but we still start by facing the problem. Right. Well, and, and what you just said actually opens up a greater can of worms. So um, I wrote an article called The Five Laws of Cybersecurity. And law number one is if there's a vulnerability, it will be exploited. Right. Mm. And I mean, that, that's, <laughs> I mean, it's just obvious. Right. And law number two is everything is vulnerable in some way. You know, even if we haven't discovered it, but I'm, I'm, I'm taking your logic and I'm applying it to pretty much everything. So we don't even have to look at the hardware level to see examples of the openness. So, so USB, which is a great example of that, you know, is very open. It's, it's universal, literally universal. Um, and then we look at other platforms that can get people in trouble uh, just outside of hardware and software, like Facebook, like social media, where we can see people abuse what is essentially an open system to deliver disinformation at the human level, not necessarily at the, at the hardware or software layer. So it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And, um, Yossi, first, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to me here. Um, I'm looking at the time and have to wrap this up um, a little bit. But uh, if people want to get a hold of you, if, if, you're, if they're an enterprise customer that is watching this, and I know I've got a few that, that watch my videos, um, how can they get a hold of you? Sepio.systems, easy. Sepio. A, contact us from there, easy. We get many, many uh, you know, 
uh, submissions uh, every week, we re respond to everyone. So just Great. send us a query. So no Sepio, quotes, just ask questions. Sepio.systems. Sepio Sepio.systems, okay. And this has been Yossi Albaba. I'll give you the final word. Do you, do you want anything or, or want anything? Do you have anything to <laughs> say or do you want to say anything is what I meant. Yeah, to say. just very short sentence. Uh, there is a threat, we need to understand it, and then we need to mitigate it. But let's start by understanding there is a threat. And pushbacks don't help anyone, uh, especially not forgetting security. Absolutely, I completely agree. And Yossi, again, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to speak thank with you me today. And uh, to all you guys out there, thank you very much for watching or listening or however it is. And as always, stay safe and stay online. Thanks, guys.